Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Scott Feinberg with The Hollywood Reporter, and so glad you could be with us today because uh, it is my great honor and privilege to introduce uh, a man who, at just 31, has already proven himself among the finest actors of his generation. He has packed a ton into the last decade. Um, we all know that he played a brooding vampire, Edward Cullen, in five phenomenally popular Twilight movies, which turned him into an international star. And in addition to that series, he has been hired by and done acclaimed work for just about, you know, he's making his way through all the great directors out there right now. We've got David Cronenberg twice, Werner Herzog, James Gray, Anton Corbin, David Michaud, and now in what I and a lot of other people think is his best work yet, what you've just seen, uh, the Softy Brothers in Good Time. So at this rate, it seems there's nothing that he can't do, and it's extremely exciting to see what he's going to do over the coming decade and decades. Uh, we do know for sure, though, what he's doing today, and that is joining us here at SCAD for the Savannah Film Festival. And so I hope you'll join me in welcoming Robert Pattinson. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and they were doing that before you came out at the end of the movie, so we know they really love this movie. I like, I like, the, uh, I like the screams for Werner Herzog as well. <laughs> Some really enthusiastic. He's got Werner a big uh, cult down here. So, uh, well, thank you for coming. I know it's a big trip. And um, I guess I want to just sort of set the scene for this movie in the, in the broader context of your career. You, uh, y you know, the world got to know you through the Twilight movies, but even during, in between those, you, when you, you could have been at home laying on the couch, you know, having a beer, you worked during those hiatuses, or uh, is that the proper plural? I don't know, during those hiatuses. And, uh, and I just wonder, first of all, why, what that was about. Were you kind of thinking long-term as far back as that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I was kind of, yeah, I think it, once something becomes, s the first Twilight became so big and it suddenly like, your, your control of your life suddenly feels wrenched away from you. I think the, the, the easiest way to feel like you're controlling it again is just to keep working yeah. all the time. Um, so yeah I, I, yeah, I think there was a period of like five years where I just didn't stop really. Yeah. And um, you know, w we can touch upon some of those, but I think we should also mention just that, to remind people because we all know what Twilight became, but the first movie was, as far as you knew when you started to do it, and it, the first one was an indie feel, indie budget, indie director, Catherine Hardwick. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like you had suddenly decided, I'm going to go make a massive franchise when you signed up for the first, right? Yeah, no, not at all. Like it was, it was, yeah, it was time. It was, it was, no one ever believes me when I when I say that now. But like, I couldn't even get the books at Barnes and Noble when I uh, when I did the first one. You had to order them off Amazon. It was that early? Yeah, yeah. Wow. So, post Twilight, I mentioned some of these filmmakers that you worked with, and it's incredible. And I just want to list the films now as well. Cronenberg with Cosmopolis and Maps of the Stars both went to Cannes. Uh, Michaud, The Rover, Herzog, Queen of the Desert. Uh, Corbin Life and James Gray, Lost City of Z, and now this one, of course, with the Softies. Is there anything that all of these share in common? Is there something that um, you specifically were seeking that led you to all of these ones? Um, uh, I mean, character-wise, not really, but I mean, I think in terms of directors who have a very singular approach, they have a very strict identity yep. that, that um, I think you work with someone who you know that they, if they put their name on something, it's gonna it's gonna be their movie afterwards. Um, and I was trying to find that. I think real mm -hmm. every one of these uh, uh, tours, as they mm -hmm. say. Um, I want to also ask you, um, you know, if you, I guess, with the Softy Brothers, these are guys that have primarily worked with like micro budgets on their movies, typically not with people who have been actors professionally before. How did how familiar with their work were you, and how did you guys end up teaming up? Um, I mean, I wasn't familiar with them at all, embarrassingly. <laughs> but um, but uh, I'd seen this this still. Uh, I told the story a million times, but like uh, uh, I, I saw a still on on uh, 
indie yeah. website, and um, and there was just something about it I just really loved. And uh, from one of the earlier, movies. yeah, from Heaven Knows What, yeah. and then I kind of committed to this on the strength of like nothing. Like I mean, I kind of there was no script for this. There was nothing, I, and I I really liked them in the meeting, but I hadn't seen anything really. Yeah. Um, and yeah, charming guys. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> just so good looking. <laughs> double, double dose of them. So uh, they, um, I, I guess this this script and character, uh, Connie. They there's it doesn't feel like anything we've seen you do before. And I wonder if you can kind of pinpoint um, what some of the specific, you know, new territory for you was as an actor with this one. Did you what were what were the things you were most excited to? bite into with this guy as, as the script sort of eventually did come together? Um, I mean, I like things with, where the moral compass of a character is not, it's, it's quite vague. Um, it's, I think the interesting part for me of this movie is that you don't, re, I mean, if you add up the sum of his actions, he's ostensibly a bad person, but there's something about it that like, you can't like entirely put him into a box that he's a bad person. Um, and that's always fun. It kind of, it frees you up to do quite a lot of different things in the, in the performance. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that sort of dynamic, like New York energy, I think um, all the movies which I grew up watching and kind of being influenced by were all that kind of sort of like, um, like hustlers and stuff, yeah. and sort of uh, like the opposite of being an English person, basically. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, what was your reaction? I guess how early on did you find out, and what was your reaction to finding out that one of these co-directors, Benny, was not only going to be directing you, but was also going to be playing your mentally challenged brother? I, I mean, it turned out great. It could have gone very wrong. I mean, he he auditioned for it, um, and a lot of people auditioned for it. Uh, and when they sent me Benny's audition tape, I mean, it's kind of unfair because Benny can literally improvise as that character for an entire day, and so like no one can really, no one can, no one can compete with it at all. Um, so yeah, I was kind of I watched his audition tape, and it was. 40 minutes of him in character. And I, I, I mean, it's just, it was insane. I mean, I was more nervous about him kind of out acting me after. <laughs> <laughs> now, logistically, how does this work? Like, you, the end of a scene, does he just break character and say cut, or how does this not, work? Yeah, not really. I mean, it's kind of, that was, there were scenes when he has all the bandages yeah. on his face after the hospital. I mean, he's literally, kind of would break character like 25% and yeah. then kind of, so he'd still sort of have his voice and stuff and then kind of direct me when he's in a scene with me, but also our character dynamics as well. I mean, I was literally, whenever he said something, you're kind of just like, shut up. <laughs> I, would have to, I would have to get him to say it to Josh and then say it to me afterwards, right. Right. Um, which, yeah, it was interesting. I mean, yeah, I was wondering, have you ever had anything like that? I don't think too many actors have where you're, I actually did it, the, the movie I did immediately afterwards, really? I did it with two, two directors with his, with his illness, who were both in the movie. Um, yeah, so I did it, another, another sibling um, <laughs> double act. So um, talk about, was there one scene or moment in this movie that challenged you the most? Was there something where you felt, maybe even when you looked at the call sheet, you're like, oh, geez, I'm not looking forward to this day, and then it turned out okay. I want to just kind of ask you that. Um, I mean, it was all so kind of, like, uh, it was very, like, seat of your pants kind of thing, so you could never really fully prepare for stuff. I remember the last, the last scene with, um, me and Buddy Ray having the argument, um, that was kind of crazy because, uh, I mean, the dynamic of the scene is totally different from what it was, it was supposed to me to be me just like completely laying into Buddy and just humiliating him. And um, Buddy the day before was just like, I'm just not having a scene when, when you're gonna, you're just gonna humiliate me. So, and I, I remember like turning up to set and I could just see him sitting in the set like ready. <laughs> and, he was and, I was like, and he'd planned out all these comebacks and like, um, and we were kind of improvising a lot of that scene at the end and so, 
uh, but it ended up being kind of interesting because it's sort of it's it's Connie basically looking in the mirror and accusing accusing another person of being a disgrace when he's just describing himself. Um, and uh, but yeah, that, I think that was that was one of the more nerve wracking scenes. But it was really fun though. How do you like improvising? Is that something that has been a part of most of the movies you've worked on, or not so much? Um, I don't really like it. I mean, I like, I really like good writing, and I think, you know, you'd think if if you can just improvise a movie, then like it's completely negates the writing. I mean, it's like I spend my entire life trying to look for good scripts, and like I kind of want someone to write it well. But uh, I think in in that scene, especially I, if I if I hype myself up enough, so I don't I'm not self conscious at all and don't understand really what's going on. Sometimes you get a few good pieces out of it. But um, yeah, I think it devolves into just swearing at each other too easily. <laughs> well, Everyone's just doing Reservoir Dogs <laughs> impressions. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing that I remembered uh, hearing you say was that you and I, I guess Benny had a, did some interesting character development before any of the cameras ever rolled. And that, but in, in not the normal, like, let's just talk about our our characters and their history kind of way, but actually via email? Um, yeah, we were writing like um, letters from Connie in, in prison. Um, and we did that for a while. That was when I was shooting Lost City of Z. Um, but uh, that went on for a while. And then, and then we did stuff kind of in character, like just going out into the world, trying to kind of just see how people reacted to the the sibling dynamic between us, um, which is kind of interesting too. I suspect not a lot of people would have recognized you with this uh, flop sweat and all the other things this guy's <laughs> got. So, we, um, Well, one thing actually where I believe there was on-camera interaction with just unaware un, uh, members of the public were, was the mall sequence, right? Yeah. How did that work? Uh... I mean, there was a lot of stuff. It was interesting because when we were doing the police chase, it was funny because uh, we had, no one knew we were shooting a movie, but people were dressed up as cops, like run, chasing after us. But the general public kept trying to get in the way of the cops and we're like, like trying to trip them up and stuff, like getting that <laughs> out of the way. But, but then like the ironic thing as well was that Josh had hired real cops, so they were actually real cops, and they were like <laughs> trying to, they were thinking about actually arresting the people. Oh which was, so it became like an actual, an actual uh, crime scene as we were shooting it. <laughs> which, <laughs> it's nice to know they wanted you to get away. Let's see, yeah, they exactly. had your back. <laughs> um, so the movie premiered at Cannes in May, uh, was phenomenally received there, and um, and has continued to be as it's rolled out more and more. And I just wonder what it's been like for you to get this type of uh, reception, particularly your performance, um, in some cases from people who may have given you a hard time in the past. <laughs> it might make it extra sweet, I don't know. But I mean, really, what this is, you've gotta be feeling pretty good. This is the best, uh, I, would, I would think, as, as well received as anything you've done. Yeah, no, it's great. I mean, it, it's kind of, uh, I didn't, it's really nice to know that it, it was such a kind of a punt. I don't know how you describe it, like a punt from yeah. like having no script at the beginning. And I just, I just really knew it was going to be something. Um, I meant to see Josh and Benny, like kind of go into like the stratosphere, directing things for everybody now. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I don't know. It's great. It's it's also it's just kind of nice as well when people. It's it's just. I mean, in a lot of ways, sort of against type, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. It's nice for people to sort of believe, at least believe it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess. I wonder if we can close with a few big picture questions, just sort of your mm -hmm. take on some things. So now that you've done this sort of territory of something that you've not previously really done before, what what is the next thing you would most like to be given the opportunity to do that you haven't done? Is there some kind of a character or genre or uh, anything like that? I don't know. I think just the longer I do it, I just realize it's just, you just pick directors. That's it. That's like, it's, it's, the, it's the only thing you have to do. Um, and just go after, just 
go after the best directors. Um, and the, you don't have to think about anything else. You don't even have to read the script. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were saying, like... It doesn't uh, even have to be a script. Right. <laughs> and, and, just, and you were like, I think just between us, if it doesn't make any money, that's okay also, right? <laughs> but um, one other thing, though, I wondered is having made five movies, I guess, in five years that were part of a, a big franchise, would you ever do another franchise-type project? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's the same thing. It's just like, it's, if, if there's a director, it's just always a director. Yeah. Um, I think, anyway. I mean, you know, until you've got, you know, tons of alimony to pay and stuff, <laughs> like, then, 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 then everything changes again. <laughs> well, we should even remind folks, I mean, th there were some great directors of those films, Bill Condon and yeah, won yeah. An Oscar and a lot of people. Um, so, but that's interesting. So just as long as it's a great director, no limitations yeah, I mean, on whatever else. Yeah, if it's like, you know, if, if suddenly Claire Denis is doing yeah, Spider-Man, Spider <laughs> I'm like, I'm 100% down. <laughs> uh, yeah, that needs another reboot, I think, after <laughs> three. Um, if you had to name one other actor working today, maybe somebody who's older, been doing it a little longer, and, and you had a gun to your head, you have to name somebody whose career trajectory you would most like the rest of yours to resemble. It doesn't mean you're gonna make the exact same choices, but the kind of career that you imagine for yourself going forward. Who, who else is uh, kind of a model to you? I don't know, I mean, uh, like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess, I, I was talking about it earlier. I mean, I remember working with Paul Giamatti on, on Cosmopolis and just when we had this big scene together and I was so nervous about it because it was this really long scene. It was really complicated and, and I was just absolutely terrified. And then when I went to set, he was I just saw Paul just like trembling. And I was just thinking like that. Uh, the, I've thought about it more and more since. I, that's what, that's, I, I just want to feel like that when I, when I, in, I don't know how much older Paul is for me, <laughs> but like, but when you've just done so many movies and you still have that kind of the, the level of adrenaline and that kind of the fear um, and and the need to prove yourself, like it's I find it's the most satisfying thing. I mean, it drives you completely crazy on one hand. If you're kind of trying to satisfy this uh, this amorphous blob, that, <laughs> this, this hole inside you that's right. never going to be filled by anything. Um, <laughs> but like, but it's nice. But it's nice to yeah. But there's something nice about having a hole to fill. <laughs> <laughs> what better? What better place to to end on that? We are excited to. Uh, <laughs> we will be uh, <laughs> we are very excited that you are here and are going to be uh, filling a hole on your mantelpiece later this evening <laughs> so uh, congratulations and thank you so much for coming <laughs> thanks a lot thank you.